that I'm going to talk a little about something for people who are not in this field so they get a little into it, and then also about a little of the history of the field, and then something about the technology, and I will talk about the discovery. But Kip will talk about the things that made it possible for people to understand the discovery. I hope that's what you're going to talk about. And the other thing is about the future of what might come of this field, which is actually very important. I'm not going to talk about that. So let me start by something which might insult the intelligence of several of you in the room, but it's actually quite necessary for those of you who have never thought about general relativity. And that is, why is this suddenly a new field? What happened in 1915? And that's, this picture is the best I'm going to do with that. I mean, Newton's theory was a wonderful theory. We still live with it, and most of our calculations that we do and when we talk about gravity to people in college and high school, we talk about Newton. And what was the thing that drove Einstein to think of about another way of doing it? And that was primarily what this picture sort of implies. It doesn't give you the story in a long shot. It was that, uh, that in Newton's theory, you couldn't deal with things that are moving very fast, it was because special relativity wasn't part of it. And for the same reason, it didn't have in it any way, this is a Newton theory, of making information be able to travel from one place to another over a, with a finite speed. And well, there's no implication of how information travels in Newton's theory, but it doesn't say anything about how there are, when something happens in some part of the universe, how quickly you might get the information gravitationally. And those are gravitational waves. And so to get into this, and I'm not going to give you any deep lesson in general relativity. I can't do that. But I want to just give you a feel for it and why some of the things that follow might make sense. And that is that what you're seeing here, and I, is it possible to turn the lights down a little bit? Or, OK. Uh, what, what that is is I don't know how many of you know what a jungle gym is. I mean, just find out who, who knows what a jungle gym is. Oh, many of you. Anyone who comes from New York knows what a jungle gym is. This is one cut through a jungle gym, a two-dimensional cut through a, a jungle gym that you've made. And uh, OK. And uh, what it is is, they, is you have laid this out before you, you've put things into it. You laid it out with effectively rigid rods. And you've labeled space in a way that put, you put things in the x direction, the y direction, the z direction. And they're intersections of all these jungle gym bars. And the other thing you've done is you put a clock, the very expensive thing you've done. You put a clock at each point where there's an intersection. And that was all nice, rectangular and rigid. And then something happened. You put the sun into that system, and you put the earth into that system, and you made. OK. Uh, well, <laughs> you put the sun into that system, and what it has done is it has distorted space near the sun, and of course there's a little distortion near the Earth as well. You don't have, the, I didn't put the clocks in, or the people who drew this picture didn't put the clocks in, but the clocks out here all keep the same time. It's not so easy to do that, uh, you know, how to do that. You have to go to each clock and set it so it's going at the same time. But in here, they, the clocks are moving more slowly. And a little bit less in here, there's a, some slowing of the clocks as well. And so this business of the distortion of space and the distortion of time is a geometric way of looking at gravity. And what then, as John Wheeler said, uh, that, the, that distortion in space and time is the thing that impels things to move. And that's as much as I'm going to tell you, OK? So that's the mindset you have to have when you get to now talking about um, this new way of looking at gravitation. And now I will meet you, introduce you to gravitational waves. And I'll be a little more careful with that, because you do have to understand this carefully. So first of all, uh, gravitational waves are, uh, they are expected in this theory to move at the speed of light. They are transverse waves. In other words, they move just like E&M waves. They do their dirty work transverse the direction in which they're moving. And uh, they uh, cause a, uh, and they come from accelerated masses. Just very much as electromagnetic waves come from accelerated charges, there are different symmetries here. But the accelerated mass is the source of gravitational waves. It's just that spherically symmetric accelerations of systems does not radiate. But things, for example, like an orbiting object, and we'll talk a lot about that, that's not spherically symmetric. That radiates. Or two things that are colliding, they radiate. And I want to show you what a gravitational wave does. And the way you want to imagine this, I'll get this, this is a little animation. But here's that red square is where you're standing, right there. 
And this set of dots, think of it as a set of weightless masses or very, very light masses that don't perturb the system that you've sprinkled into the space. And the gravitational wave is either going into this picture or coming out of it. That's the way. And here's what, it look, here's what the motion looks like. OK, so with this motion, you have to analyze a little bit what's going on here. You'll notice that there is a contraction in one direction while there is an expansion in the other. And they keep flipping back and forth. That's one thing. So that's, a, and that's an important thing when you look at the design of any device that might want to detect a gravitational wave. You exploit that. The compression in one direction of space and expansion in the other. And it oscillates, it keeps changing. The other property of it that's important is that you'll notice that whatever the motion is, you look at these two dots right next to you, they don't move very much. But then you look at the dots that are quite far from you, and they move a lot. And that is a, a picture in any one dimension at one moment is a picture of constant strain. In other words, the change in distance between the objects divided by their separation is a constant at any one instant. Okay? It's the same as though when you pull a rubber band and you, put band, you, put, you, you, you make marks on a rubber band, pull the rubber band a little bit, make the marks, and then start pulling on it. And you'll notice that the things that are, you're holding on to move a lot more than in their relative separations than the things that are close to the middle of the rubber band. And that's the other important gradient of a gravitational wave. In other words, that thing which I just described to you, delta L over L, is called the, is called the strain in space. And that's what we measure when we try to do this. OK? So that's the, and uh, here's sort of an interesting thing that really, you have the Einstein papers here in Jerusalem. Uh, and I've asked people to look this up. And I'll tell you what this is. This is a little piece of history. Uh, Einstein wrote his first papers on gravitational waves. He wrote the general theory of relativity in 1915. And he finally completed the field equations that we now under, we understand better because of people like Kip. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the, the, those field equations are, were developed at the sort of in November, December, I think, of 1915. But in 1916, Einstein wrote another paper, which was an application of perturbation calculations of the more general field equations, which were very much more complicated, the sort of linearization of those equations. And in that paper, he describes gravitational waves for the first time, the ones I just showed you. And he makes a wonderful little mistake, which you can look up. It's just he gets an answer wrong. But the most important thing at the end of the paper, he, despite the mistake, he says something quite dramatic. And he said, here's, he says it in German. I translated it for you here in English. He, this equation, and I don't want to derive that equation for you. I'm just saying this is sort of the power in a gravitational wave. And this is a source of the gravitational wave, time derivatives of the moment of inertia of a mass distribution. And he's referring to this equation in this equation. He says, so, so you, know, you, you can read it in German. It's underlined. But in any case one can think of, that's what this is, A, that quantity, will have a practically vanishing value. In other words, in that paper, he says, this will never be of any consequence. I mean, nothing that you can do anything about. And I've asked the people both in, in Munich, where they have, I mean, in, in Berlin, and I've asked people here in, in Jerusalem to look in the, in the Einstein notes where he must have done the back of the envelope calculations that gave him that answer from his field equations. So I was a little presumptuous, and I made myself into Einstein for a moment. Okay, not that you ever would confuse us, but. Uh, the, uh, the thing is, I, I took some things, and here's uh, some formulas that you might be, actually, if you're interested in this thing, in a sort of postcard way, this is a very useful relation. I mean, just walk you through this. That's H. That's the delta L over L. That's the strain. And uh, what it's proportional to, and there are, this, is, this is a pretty good formula. It works to factors of two or three. Uh, it, the strain that comes from a, a dynamical situation is proportional to G, that's Newtonian's constant, times the mass of the system, divided by the distance you're away from it, divided by c squared. That quantity, gm over rc squared, is in fact a dimensionless constant of how strong, gravitational, how strong gravi gravity is. For example, here in this room, that number is around 10 to the minus 10. And on the surface of the sun, if you were able to go there, it would be about 10 to the minus 6. And on what we're going to talk about near the end of this talk, near the horizon of a black hole, it's about one. That's quite a dramatic change of values, OK? But, and then, in order to make it into something that's dynamical, you multiply this by the velocity of the, of the system, and I would get to some examples in a second, divided by the velocity of light, squared. 
that quantity, beta, which you use in general, special relativity. So that quantity, gm over rc squared times z squared over c squared, and that's a velocity that's not a radial velocity in a spherical motion, but rather, for example, a tangential velocity in a, in a, uh, a circular motion or a collisional, relative collisional velocity. And so I've done some numbers for you. Where I, we're not gonna, I'll get to this later. This is, uh, the, uh, so let's take two trains colliding each other. I mean, that's sort of, I'm, take, I'm giving you what Einstein might have been able to do in 1915. And the trains in those days still go about the same as they do now, at least in the United States, which is a, and, uh, I, it's an outrage. I have to tell you that. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so the mass, of, the mass of trains about 10 to the 5 kilograms, those two guys, they move at 100 kilometers per hour. The collision takes a third of a second. And you have to be a distance far enough away so you're not in the induction zone, in the, in the way you just see the static fields or the non-radiation fields. You have to be a wavelength away. And you know they travel at the velocity of light. So you do that, you put that into this relationship, and you wind up with a number that really is hopeless. I mean, truly hopeless, 10 to the minus 42. So that immediately tells you you're not going to do a Hertz experiment. And Einstein must have, I mean, he's, he, was, you know, he was a patent office clerk. He knew how to do these things. So that he must have made that number. I'd love to see the calculation he did. He might have done another number. This is a, maybe a better way of looking at it. He, might have, he already knew about double star systems. Uh, they didn't know about the galaxy, but they knew about double star systems. And so he might have taken a solar mass. That here's a double star system, and that's doing an accelerating motion. You put in the velocities for it and do that. Just put it into this formula. Assume a day period. Assume it's uh, something they didn't know at the time, but he probably might have guessed that it was 10 kilo light years away to some stars, maybe one, I don't, doesn't much matter. It's, it's linear in the R. And what you get is a number that is tiny, but in terms of what we now can talk about, that's not outrageous. It's 10 to minus 23, but with a period of half a day. You see, this system looks the same every time it goes around halfway. So it's gonna have double the frequency of the, ro of the rotation. And uh, you put some numbers into what might be the, and this you need this for, which I'll get to at the, at more at the end of the talk. You get to the, the amount of the Q, which is sort of the energy stored in such a system, divided by the energy radiated, which you get from the quadrupole formula in that first, it's not in the first paper, it's in the 1918 paper. And you get a number that says Q is about 10 to the 15. Or if you take a year and do that, you say, look, it, it takes about 10 to the 13 years before you see aspect the aspect of that system changing enough so in a telescope you might have seen them getting closer together. It's utterly hopeless. Okay? So again, that's hopeless. And I can understand why he said that. Okay? And I'd love to see, as I say, the actual back of the envelope or notebook calculations he did to do this. So that's the way it stood for many, many, many years. And there were a lot of theoretical work done on gravitational waves, but nothing really experimental. And I, the very, this is not the first thing that happened, but this is the first significant thing that happened, is the discovery by Hulse, who was a graduate student, and Joe Taylor, uh, who was a professor at, at that time at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, and they found an, an unbelievably important system. They found this system, and they did it all by radio astronomy. Uh, they found a star which was pulsating at about 17 times a second. Pulsating stars like that had been already established. These are pulsars. They probably, and we now know very definitely, they are neutron stars, and they tend, they can rotate, and they have a plasma, a strong magnetic field that comes out of them, and there can be a plasma around the neutron star, which in fact acts like a searchlight beam. It makes both light and radio waves that you, every time it goes around, you could be intersecting it with a, with a radio antenna or an optical detector. And so imagine uh, what they noticed that this star, where they had a, the radio telescope they were looking at, it was Arecibo in Puerto Rico, and uh, they noticed that this 17 times a second wasn't absolutely constant. It was sometimes a little faster, sometimes a little slower. And what that was interpreted as was that it was here is one star, and there was, they then divined from that that there was another star, another uh, invisible star. You couldn't, nobody saw anything. This whole thing was invisible to optical telescopes. You couldn't see a thing. And uh, what it is, is it's two pulsars. And why was this sometimes going faster and sometimes slower? Because it was an orbit around. They were an orbit around each other. And here, let's say, is where the radio telescope is. And when it was moving toward you, this system, uh, it was going a little faster. When it was moving away from you, it was going a little slower. And that had an eight-hour period. And that system was enough. By the way, the GM over RC squared in that system, the strength of the gravitational field of that 
uh, that's, that pulsar at this one, as later was discovered, is about the same as the, sun, where the surface of the sun, about 10 to the minus 6. So that's a pretty big field. I mean, big in terms of being able to do anything with it. And so it turns out that uh, that then, they, they did a beautiful model of all the different relativistic effects that went on. And here's the curve that really was the most definitive one of them. It, this won them the Nobel Prize, not only this curve, but the, the study of that system. And what, this is epic. This is, uh, you know, starting about 1973, and this picture happens to end in 2000. And what this is all about is the time it takes for the orbit to go once, but not the total number. It's, it was changing. The orbit was getting faster and faster. It was losing time. The orbit, got, the orbit got faster and faster, meaning these things were getting closer together, and they were losing energy. Even though things are going faster, they're losing energy. That's important. And so here is the change in the period, it's, uh, the change in period, as, and as this, what this minus sign indicates. And here's a curve with dots in it. See the dots all along it? That's the prediction that you would have gotten, or they got, from using Einstein's theory for that particular loss of energy by the system. And the line that's running through it, which is not a fit, that's the actual just line in that, that you would have gotten, is in fact the prediction of Einstein's theory for the rate of change of that orbit. And that's also the very first indication that there was gravitational radiation emitted by that system. That's the first time man ever saw gravitational waves. Not the waves directly, but the influence of the waves. That's a landmark. Okay. So that was in, uh, well, you can see the epics, and it's still going on. And more systems like that have been found. And they play an important role in our research as we go forward now. And by the way, stop me at any moment, because I am not shy. You can stop me and ask questions. I have no problem with that. Okay? Uh, so if I talk too fast or I'm being confusing, just stop me. Okay? So the next event I want to tell you about is actually a thing that happened a little before this. And that was uh, Joe Weber We're working with John Wheeler at sort of getting the idea at a very important point in the history of the, the field, namely the Chapel Hill Conference in in North Carolina in about 1957. They were both attendees to that, and there was this, this whole conference. This is quite late now. Remember, it's 1915 is when this all invented, and through the 20s and through the 30s and through the 40s, things had become mostly mathematical. That's one of the troubles. And then there was this revitalization in the field of the combination of physics and mathematics together. That's what that Chapel Hill Conference did. And at that conference, uh, Joe and Joe Weber and, and, and and John Wheeler invented an idea that they were hoping to look for gravitational waves directly. Okay? And the idea that they had was, and this is Joe, and here's the, the idea, many of you know about this, is this is a, the, the idea they had was that that pattern I showed you where the dots were going apart like that, you can re-express that as a force if you want. And there's a way of doing that, and you can ask me how to do that. Uh, I'm not going to tell you right now, but you can think of it as pulling that bar apart and pushing it together and also squeezing it in one direction and pulling it apart in the other. And here's Joe mounting little sensors on this huge piece of aluminum. And you can see it's pretty big. It's bigger than he is. And, uh, and these are little sensors that measure the distortion of the bar. They're, they're strain gauges that measure that. And that was an experiment that started sort of in the early 60s. And in 1969, Joe Weber made a very astounding publication. He said that he had discovered gravitational waves. He's seen them coincident in a bar like that in, in Maryland, which is where his office was, another one in a golf course not too far, about eight miles from his, from his office. He saw them coincident. And then he also saw again, another one of these in Chicago in the Argonne National Laboratories. And he was seeing two or three coincidences of something pulling that bar apart and pushing it together again, coming through it and let the bar sing. And the bar sort of kept singing after it got hit like that. We think of it as being hit by a, by a hammer. That's one way of thinking about it. He saw these three events, three, four events a day. And he also thought he saw them maximally when this bar is most sensitive to gravitational waves coming from the galactic center. Now, there was some history of that. I won't go into all of it. But and that turned out to be one of the most exciting discoveries for a lot of people. Started probably 12 groups in the whole world. I don't think there was one in Israel. But there were other, Japan, Russia, England. The uh, United States had four groups all doing these experiments, some identically to the way that Joe did them, 
and others in their own manner. And what happened really was very disappointing. At the end, no group saw the same thing that Joe Weber did. What was the strain? That what, pardon me? What was the strain? That yeah, that that that's a very good question. He's asked, what was the strain? Joe didn't think of strains. He thought of energy, but I, we converted that into strains. And Kip may correct me here. My, my guess is the strain that he was sensitive to was around 10 to the minus 14, a delta L over L of about 10 to the minus 14 at a kilohertz, at one kilohertz. Now, it could be 10 to the minus 13 and a half. I don't know. It's of order that. Okay? And that was, as we will find out, way, way too big. Okay? What was he seeing as something completely different? I can't. I have some my theories. I'll, if you ask me questions later, not now. If you want to know what I think it was, we did some experiments. It could have been something magnetic. I don't know what it was. It was never settled. So the next thing that was done and talked about and thought about was to do it a different way. This sort of started at the time when Weber's experiments no longer looked like they were succeeding by the early 70s. Uh, and let me walk you through this. This is a little tricky, and, and I will look at you to see if you find that this is I decided to really make you understand how one of these things works. Okay? This is an interferometer, like a Michelson interferometer. And the idea, I'll give you the basic idea, but then I want to walk you through it with these little vectors. Here's a laser. And this is, again, by the way, the same, you're trying to measure that pattern that I showed you with the dots. Okay? That's really, so there's nothing new here. It's just how do you do it? And uh, so here's a laser, that's a light source. There's a beam splitter. That's the thing that divides the light. Half of it gets reflected. Half of it gets transmitted. And here's one of the distant mass. And there's another distant mass. In that picture I showed you of the, of the gravitational wave, think of the little red square being right there. That's where you were standing. And then these are these distant dots. And these will move in and out with the gravitational wave if you think of it as a force. And uh, what you do is you arrange it so, and I'll show you how this works. You arrange it so, first I'll say it in words, that you make the time it takes light to go from here to there and back again on this side exactly the same as the light that takes, takes light to go from here to there and back again. You may, if you make those the same, it turns out, and I'll show you this in a second, no light gets to the photodetector. None. In other words, equal paths on the two sides makes no light go to the photodetector. It all returns back to the laser. Now let me show you what's, that's sort of, and that's the basic idea of the detection, but I want to go one level deeper so you'll understand why the improvements that were made on this make sense. So let me take you one step further now. And the step further is actually to look at what happens to the light in that system if a gravitational wave comes down on it. So here's a, think of this as a, the, the, the purple the arrow show you the direction of propagation of the light. And red means the carrier light. That's the light that's coming out of the laser. So it comes down, so it's propagating this way. It hits the beam splitter, and there's a plus and a minus sign on this beam splitter. That's to satisfy the Maxwell equations on a thing like that. What happens on the plus side is when the electric field of the light hits that and reflects it, the electric field stays in the same sense. It points in the same direction. And when the light comes from the other side, and we'll talk about where there's a minus sign, the electric field flips over. That's the difference between the plus and the minus sign. Okay? So, uh, so OK, the first goes on, comes along. The red vector comes along. It goes down this way. It gets a little reduced. You can see it because. Uh, the 0.7 of the electric field goes this way. It keeps hitting. It hits that mirror. That mirror is moving back and forth due to the gravitational wave. And there it is. It's coming along back to this system. And you'll notice two things have been added to it. There is the carrier. It's the same height as it is here. But the sideband, that's, that's at a different frequency. That frequency, if that point, this is the frequency axis, that axis. And if that, that's a little higher frequency, in fact, it's the frequency of the gravitational wave in difference, that difference. And this is minus the frequency of the gravitational wave, that. So these two sidebands are opposite like this, and they're phase-modulated sidebands because of the mirror is moving, not amplitude-modulated, because the, the reflection is perfect, let's say. So it comes along, and that travels back to the beam splitter. And now let's so think of it there. We'll leave it there for a moment. Now look at the beam that went through this. The beam that goes through this, there it is. It has its carrier. And then it comes and hits this mirror. But remember, this mirror is moving. When this guy's moving in, this guy's moving out. They have opposite phase in which they're moving. And so you come back, and here are the sidebands that are on it. And you'll notice they're opposite. And if you compare this picture to that picture. Where this goes negative, that guy goes positive. And conversely for the, the green guys. So these two sidebands are also generated by the motion of this, but they have opposite sign. 
compared to those, and they come to the beam splitter, and these get reflected. Now let's watch. The ones that get transmitted here, that guy gets transmitted to the photodetector, and this guy gets reflected on the back side of this to the photodetector. And you'll notice the two sidebands have added. In other words, this is bigger, and then, uh, and then where's the other guy? There, there he is. That's bigger. That's bigger than either this guy, or the, the, the bigger than that guy, or that guy. And so that business of the beam spitter flipping it has increased the sidebands that are due to the motion of the masses from the gravitational wave, and it has eliminated the carrier. There's no carrier anymore. That's the same thing because you've canceled the carrier itself. So this is a dark point, but it has the information in it of the gravitational wave. Are you with me? OK, good. And so that's very important, because now comes what you need to do. Okay, so you, that's the basic idea. In other words, even though there is a dark fringe at that point, the information, the sideband information, the phase modulated sideband information from the gravitational wave does appear at the detector. Okay, so now. Uh, okay, so you go and talk to Kip in 1979 or 80, 1980, certainly by 1980, Kip knew all of this. He knew that Weber, well, he knew that you had to do this well at least, 10 to the minus 21. And he had done this from many ways. And what that meant is that you had to take that, even that structure, the thing I just described to you, and make improvements on it that were un, really enormously difficult. And I'll tell you, here's sort of the way to say it. You had to learn how to make an interferometer that would measure 10 to the minus 12 of the wavelength of the light that we use. In other words, you have to have an improvement by 10 to the minus 12 just over the wavelength. The wavelength of light is 10 to the minus 6 meters. You had to, you, you had to get down to 10 to the minus 18 meters in a 4-kilometer system, for example. And that's what we people put, were thinking about. But that wasn't the only problem. That turns out to be, at one time, the relatively easier problem than the second problem, which is that you had to also make sure the mirrors that were the endpoints of that measurement weren't being kicked around by things, and I'll show you that in a minute, that were kicking the mirrors around by more than the gravitational wave would tend to induce them to move. And that turns out to be another 10 to the minus 12. Because you're here, right here in this room, you're wiggling by about a micron, at least a micron, just from the fact that the Earth is shaking. So these two factors of 10 to the minus 12 are the ones that took 40 years to do. That's about the best way to say it, OK? And uh, these are the people that did it. Um, I put F.A.E. Pirani, and those of you who are people who know the theory, he's the guy who actually, as far as convinced us, many of us in this field, that you could make measurements with light. And you could, there are others, but he's the guy whose papers were at that conference, the Chapel Hill conference, and showed, I'll say it in the fancy word of people who do relativity, that you could measure the relative motions between geodesics. That means force-free paths in, 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 of, of objects in general relativity. You could measure them, and you could measure them in a way that wasn't coordinate dependent. It didn't depend on the coordinate. It's a very important thing that he did. So the, 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 one of the ideas was this one. This one so it started at MIT. Here are the people who did it. They were all graduate students. And the idea was how to build up the intensity. How do you make the sensitivity better? So I won't go into this. This was just sort of the beginning of it. Uh, here's a laser, and then what you did is here's one of those arms, and there's another arm. I just tell you, because it gets too complicated with these diagrams. What you do is you bounce the beam many times, back and forth. You win that way. You win somewhat by doing that. And the other thing is you hang the masses, and uh, you, uh, that's the way you begin. So you get away from the ground noise of the Earth, and then you to get the sensitivity up by using lasers and by using lots of power and letting the light bounce many times. That was fairly primitive. The really in intelligent stuff was done by these, these two groups. And this group was a group at, at Max Planck Society who had been, here's a, a guy at, working with one of the Weber bars. They'd worked on that. They had done, as far as I'm concerned, the very best work on Weber's experiment and shown that there was nothing there. This was unfortunate. They were really hoping they would see something. And that same gang, they're all, many of them are physicists, but also engineers. They developed all sorts of things. They did sky, they, uh, this group of uh, underbillings who was at the Max Planck 
society, they decide to hang all the masses and then they, the, the better mirrors, they, 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 this idea, the idea of doing something which you're going to hear about called power recycling, which I'll show you what that is, which was had by this gentleman and by Ron Drever. We'll get to that group in a second. That's the group in Scotland. They had that idea, but they had very clever ideas of how to get that sensitivity. This person worried about how good the mirrors had to be. And Frau Schnuck worried about how to get those sidebands to be made into something you could see. The way it was done in the original idea down here, the, there was things put in the way of the interferometer, which was the wrong thing to do. Was, but, but she came up with a very clever idea to just unbalance the interferometer a slight bit to give you a little bit of carrier light at the detector so you could, you, you could see the, the sidebands better. So that was one group that had a, they built a three meter system and then a 30 meter system. And they, they really made a tremendous amount of progress in ICD. And then the other group, which is the group in Scotland that went ultimately to Caltech. This is Ron Drever, who is unfortunately not with us anymore. But he and, and, uh, and, and, and Harry Ward and, and Brian Mears, I'll tell you what Brian Mears did, was talk again into the forward. He invented a very clever idea to narrow band the interferometer or change the spectral response of the interferometer. I'll show you that in a second. And then Jim Huff was the group that he maintained that group. But Ron is one of the architects of all the ideas that got your know, good width of the way on that 10 to the 12 improvement that you needed. And so here's then the instrument that actually did the detection. I mean, this is now I mean, in schematic form. OK? So you'll recognize things that are in it that are some of the things I've just talked about. There's the laser, and there's that beam splitter again, and there's that far mirror, and there's that far mirror. That you now know a little about. So the next thing that was done is you put another mirror in here to bounce it back and forth many times. Now this idea came from the Glasgow group to actually make it into something where the light beams are on top of each other. That's called a fabry perot cavity. And there's another one here, and they're made as identical as possible, so that about equal times are spent on both sides of here, and so again, no light gets back to the photodetector. And now you'll notice two mirrors that you, I haven't talked about, this guy and that guy. And those are the inventions that came from, this is the thing that Billing, Schilling and also Drever invented. And the idea is fairly, it's a very sweet idea, cute idea. I think I'll walk you through this one. I'm not going to walk you through this one. I'll just tell you what that one does. This one does this. I told you earlier, and you saw that in the vector diagram, that when you make the times equal in these two arms, no light goes to the photodetector. So where does all the light go? It goes back to the, to the laser. It doesn't get lost. It goes back to the laser. And then if you do something clever at this point, namely the following, you put a partially reflecting mirror between the beam splitter and the laser, you can make it so the following thing happens. The light that comes back up from the interferometer heading toward the laser and the light that would reflect from this that comes from the laser and heads back toward the laser, this, this little path as a mirror, those two beams can be made to cancel each other interferometrically. If you make the transmission of that mirror just right, and you put the thing in the right place. And that's called power recycling. And that allows you, for example, to have a 25 watt laser here. And in this little cavity, which consists of that mirror, and that mirror, and that mirror, that little Michelson interferometer, which is really a cavity because of this, might have something like a kilowatt of light in it. This might be 25 watts. And in here, you might have something like a quarter of a megawatt of light in it because of the bouncing back and forth. So you've taken up, and what you've done by doing this is you've raised the carrier amplitude inside those cavities. So the sidebands that have been generated by the gravitational wave become enormous, enormous, as big as you can make them. That's the idea, OK? So then there's this part, remaining mirror, which is much more subtle than anything I've told you about. And that you, but you have to remember one thing. You saw the, a little bit of the idea, and then I'll, if you ask me later, I'll do, be, be a little more specific about it. But you saw that what went, went here is the sidebands that came out of the interferometer induced by the gravitational wave. They come this way toward the detector. Now you can do something which was invented by Brian Mears and Ron Drever together, but mostly by Brian Mears, and, and feed those sidebands back into the system so they have another chance to be amplified even more. But you pay a price for that. The price you pay is in the spectral response or the bandwidth of the interferometer. So you can t tailor the spectral response of the interferometer by putting this mirror, and it's called, for that reason, a signal recycling mirror. And that's enough. I'm going I'm to go on. Now, the next thing that happened is that when Ron Reaver went to Caltech, and uh, Kip was very instrumental in that, 
and uh, people at MIT began to get their system working as well, there was a proposal to make a great big detector, which is LIGO. And this is the proposal. It was, it, the proposal was written in 1989. And I just want to put it to you because it had a, had a very clever idea in it. Uh, here's, here's Kiran and there's Kip. Uh, and then there's a chief engineer. And the, the person who was director of the project at that time was Robbie Vogt, who we wanted to have run the project because the three of us, that's Kip, Drever, and I, were sort of not able to run a project like this. We were just not able to do it. And uh, so he was able to beat heads together, so we did it. And then he did one other very clever thing. Because it was known to be a difficult project, he took an engineer, and these are all engineers, and coupled them to science. I was the guy who coupled to this guy. So he took, an en he took an engineer and a scientist and made them work together to build the instrument. I'm not talking about the instrument inside, but rather the facilities how to make the vacuum system, how to make the buildings, how to make sure that nothing got nothing in the system that you had control over would compromise the measurement. That was very important in this project, and we, we, we benefited enormously, enormously from that. So I want to quickly walk you through a little bit of what are the things that you had to think about to make that instrument work. And so what's, this is a plot of, and this happens to be a plot of the initial detector. That doesn't matter. The, if things have, and you'll see in a minute what it is with the, the detector we have now. But this tells you a lot already. What this is is frequency here. So one hertz is here, 10 kilohertz is, 10 kilohertz is there. And what's plotted here is not H, but the spectrum of H. In other words, the Fourier transform of H, but it's amplitude. So for example, if you want to compare that 10 to minus 21 that Kip was talking about and when he was thinking about what you needed, you would do it here as 10 to minus 23 per root hertz. That's a spectral. So here, for example, is, a, let's say, the limit. That line, these lines are the limit of the noise of the initial detector. That we, in fact, we were very, in fact, we, the detector we built behaved this way. And down right about in there, it's sort of 10 to the minus 23. Well, the way to get that into something into the units that are RMS units, units of amplitude, not per, per hertz, you look at the frequency. It's about 100 hertz. And you take the square root of that and multiply it by square root of 100, multiply that by 10 to the minus 20. So this detector was good to a few times 10 to the minus 22, just barely better than what Kip needed. Okay? And so here are some of the noise terms in here. And I want to walk you through a few of them. Uh, the, at the high frequencies, this is called shot noise, it's, but this is part of something called quantum noise. This is the, all due to photons, and then that continues on along this line, which is radiation pressure noise. And these noises together are much like the Heisenberg microscope that you teach in a quantum course. I mean, you, if you want to measure the position of the mass very well, you need a lot of photons. That lets you reduce the phase error in measuring the position. But if you use a lot of light to do that, you begin to have fluctuations in the radiation pressure on the mirror. It's the same thing when you teach the Heisenberg microscope. And so consequently, that pushes the mass around. And that's this side right here. Now, you notice this initial detector didn't give a damn about that. It was, had other problems. But this becomes a problem as you go on. OK, and Kip gave a talk here yesterday about some of this. And he'll probably talk more about it when, I, when he talks the second part of this. I'm not so sure, but uh, you may or not. Uh, yeah, I think you've done it. Yeah, OK. Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, then, OK, so there's, that's, that's quantum noise. And you can reduce this by increasing the power. Uh, if you put more light power into it, this will go down by the square root of the power. But this gets worse as the square root of the power. So here it definitely makes sense to use more power because this isn't bothering you yet. So what does bother you? Well, look at this line. That's the, you've hung these mirrors as pendula. That's what you, they've been hung like a pendulum. And that pendulum is at room temperature. And the gas that's hit it, or even the solid state physics that's inside the supports of the pendulum wires call, have, have thermal vibrations in them, and they cause the mirror to move. So that's in this model. It turns out it wasn't too far from this. And finally, here, this thing, that remaining noise, is the fact that we didn't do very well in the first detector of getting rid of the seismic noise. And let me sort of anticipate what's next. The improved detector. This detector did not make a detection. We'll get to that in a minute. It did not. It was a very, very good zero, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But the thing that got improved, dramatically improved, so we made a detection, was 
in fact, getting the seismic noise down and getting the thermal noise down. Those two curves in the, what's called the advanced detector, which you'll see a spectrum of in a minute, was the things that made all the difference. We didn't do much about this at all. Let me point you out a couple of noise sources which are actually important for the future. And I think the most important one is this one right here, which one people you don't think of so often. It's called gravity gradient noise. And it comes shooting up below 10 hertz and is a reason why you might want to put such a thing into space. And what is that noise? That's a noise which is sort of dramatic. It's the following. You, may, you can always do very well getting rid of the seismic noise because the seismic noise is an acceleration with respect to the inertial frame. And you can make instruments that tell you what is your motion with respect to the inertial frame. They're called seismometers and accelerometers. F equals ma is a wonderful, wonderful equation. Okay? And you can use it to find out when you're moving with respect to the inertial frame. So that's great, and that's what's exploited later. But the thing you can't do is get rid of the following. The same thing that causes accelerations on the surface of the Earth also does the following. It causes density fluctuations in the ground and that move along at the velocity of, of sound in the ground. And they're both waves that compress. They're also waves that are Rayleigh waves. They also, I mean, all of these waves except... What the hell? What's that? Is that me? That was a sound wave. That was a sound wave. Okay, thank you. I see. It, helped, it helps the demonstration. Anyway, uh, okay, well, okay, didn't do it again. <laughs> uh, the, uh, anyway, so what happens is this. If you have a mirror here, and here's a sound wave coming along and compressing the ground, that compression in the ground pulls on the mirror by just plain old Newton force. And that pulls the mirror around, and that's something you can't shield against. So that's what this is. You can't shield that stuff, and that we're going to try to do other ways. I'll talk about it a little bit when we get near the end. So that's a noise that is quite important, and then there are other things in here which are just money. For example, making sure the gas isn't so high. So we, we, had, we spent money uh, to get a good vacuum and so forth. Okay. So those are the things. Here, then, are the improvements that were made, and I'm only now going to talk about the advanced detector. The thing to get, rid of the, to get both rid of the thermal noise and get rid of the seismic noise, which were the big drivers in that other picture at low frequencies, uh, what was done was, and this was provided by the people in Glasgow. This is a suspension which is much more elaborate than the one was in the initial detector. It's four pen. Here's the, this is a spring system that is attached to the ground. There's the first mass, and that mass is hung from another mass, and that mass is hung from another mass, which is like a mirror, and this is the final mirror. This is the thing you're trying to protect. And behind it is a little recoil mirror, a uh, recoil mass that allows you to push on this electrostatically. So this is the first step, this four-step quad, quadruple suspension. That's part of the thing. The other thing I won't describe except to tell you what's in it. There is this thing hanging from an object that's up here. There it is. There are these four masses. And this thing is very much like the thing that you sometimes, if you go on an airplane and you, are, you want to listen to music and you use headphones that are noise-canceling. How many of you know about that? Yeah, well, many of you do. It's the same idea. What you do is you measure the ground noise, you measure it with a seismometer, and then you push on the system to reduce the seismometer's motion. These are active vibration isolation systems. And there are three of them in series in here. I won't go through the diagram. So these three, the, the active systems in series with the passive system, gets rid of two things. It gets rid of the seismic noise to a level where it doesn't matter anymore. That's in this picture here. In fact, uh, this is now the same curve we just saw, but for the advanced detector. That's the envelope for it, if you ever get to design. We'll talk about that in a minute. And here is, for example, the seismic noise is this, uh, that color. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's this thing. It hardly matters anymore. And other noises, in fact, what limits this is thermal noise of the coatings. I, and you ask me about it later if you want. That's the, that's the coating on that mirror. The thermal noise in that coating is a limit for this, for this thing. And then there's the quantum limit, which is right there, which is... You know, we'll be, we have to do something about that, too. But we are not yet at this sensitivity. So let me show you where we are. And uh, I'll, this, is a, this is now real data. This is different than just these fictional pictures. Five minutes. Oh, my God. I'm in trouble. Uh, OK. Um, well, all right. Uh, what this is a curve of is the, the data from uh, the, the red curve is the data from uh, the instrument. This is, again, strain. Ampli spectral density versus frequency. 
And this is the data from the Virgo detector in Italy in an early day. The purple data is the, the thing I just showed you in the real data from the instrument that LIGO built initially. This is the new detector, and that's the one that made the detection. And you can see the tremendous <coughs> difference. Here, between 100 hertz and, and 10 hertz, is the region where all the improvement was. And that made it possible to make a detection. These curves, for example, this is where we ought to be, that turquoise curve. That's where we should be, and we're not. And we've tried a lot of things to figure out. Here's ultimately the design for that system, that system that's down in here. And these are then fancy detectors that are things we can contemplate for the future. I'm in trouble if there's only five minutes left. What happens if I go five minutes over? OK, I think that's what it's going to take. So, Ray, what are some of the resonances? What? What, what are some of the resonances? Oh, there's millions of resonances in here. Much of that, the, down, the, the green one is full of calibration lines, violin modes in the strings that hold the masses up, and, and calibration lines and strings are the two most important things, and some 60 hertz of multiples. Okay? In the United States, it's 60 rather than 50. Okay? And uh, so here is a disposition of these detectors. Uh, the two that made the detection are the ones in Washington State and the ones in Louisiana. But here are other detectors. This was not on the air when we made the detection. That's the, the, the Virgo detector. And uh, then there's this research detector, which is the remnant of the, of the German group that did all that elegant work. And then there are two detectors that are being planned, one in Japan and another one in India. These don't exist yet, OK? But they are planned for the future, and I, they are sort of the 2020s is sort of when you might expect something like that. Here's a quick look at the LIGO sites. Uh, it won't be long. This is just a, that's, the, that's Han Hanford looking from above. That's the beam tube, and the, that's a mountain that's up there. It's quite pretty there. That's Louisiana. It looks very lush and different. And here's the beam tube without its insulation on. And then uh, here is sort of a typical laser table, like what you find in your own labs here, and people working on it. And this is the control room at the Livingston site. OK. And these are people learning how to run the instrument from the operators. So uh, I'm going to drop this because I'm running out of time. What were the criteria for making a detection is what this is about. And it's clear that two things. They had, whatever signal you see had to be the same at both Livingston, that's the Louisiana site, and in the Washington site. And that was the number most important condition. Then there were a whole bunch of sensors to, for the environment. It shouldn't show up in any of those sensors. The wind, the magnetic fields, muons, you name it. We have sensors at each site that do that. And finally, a tremendous number of signals with inside the instrument itself that are, are monitoring the state of the instrument. And again, it shows up in those signals. You don't bother with it. And this is this famous picture that was in the, in, in, in the PRL when we made the discovery back and announced it February a year ago. And uh, I think since I... I'll tell you what, what, a couple of things about this. You could, this is the signal in, 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 in Hanford. And you can see this is noise back here. The signal that's real is right about there. Here's the same thing. This is now the <coughs> Livingston signal superposed on top of the Hanford signal. And you can see that there are places where they're much the same in here, but equivalent for the noise. And then here is a theoretical signal, theoretical with that filter. The filter that was used to see this was nothing more than the kind of things that a base and a treble control on your phonograph or your radio have. It was a huge signal. And uh, here is sort of the theoretical signal with that filter at included. And that gives you a thing which doesn't look the same as theory, as you'll see in a minute. And, this, uh, and here's the residual. This is the data. That's the theory from the Einstein field equation. And that's the residual. These two things are the residuals, and they're pretty white. And here are power spectra of the thing as a function of time. In other words, this is frequency of that signal. This is sort of the bottom of the piano. Here's middle C at 256. And these are the two signals, one at uh, one site and one at the other. And they're not exactly the same, but they're enough the same so that you can claim a detection. Whoops. And uh, then what is it? Well, that's the thing that that paper showed. Here is the signal without that bass and treble filter. It's much flatter looking. And uh, this is now a theoretical signal that comes from things that Kip will describe to you, how they've done. This was another huge triumph that people were able to do this, to use the Einstein field equations and solve them numerically. I will not go into that. Kip will tell you why that was so damned important. It is important. And what this thing is, is then the two black holes, 
going around each other, they're getting closer and closer. Eventually they smash into each other and you wave and at the end there is theoretically a little bit of ringing of the, of the geometry. We did not see that. We, said we, the signal noise wasn't good enough, but here's some gee whiz things. For example, the, uh, over time these two black holes, when they hit each other, were going sort of a relative velocity of 0.6 the velocity of light. And uh, they, as they got closer and closer. Those are huge things as that weigh sort of 30 solar masses. I'll show you that in a minute. But I want to show you one thing about the data analysis because that's something important for you to know. And that is that the data analysis was done by cross-correlating the two detectors. And this is one way it was done. Namely, you took the data at Livingston and the data at Hanford and, and you, you, you cross-correlated them. And here's sort of a way of imagining this. Take a look. This is the cross-correlation product is down here. And you take these two waveforms, which you don't know, and you cross-correlate them and you'll see that at a given delay, there is then a huge peak that occurs when, they, when you hit that, the, that they are coincident with each other. And here is sort of a plot of that data versus signal noise in that cross-correlation product. There's that event. And here is just the background noise with two different models. Let's not worry about what they are. It turns out there's another way to do the data analysis, which is what Kip will tell you a lot about, which is that you take a signal and you think you know it. And that's you, from the Einstein field equation. You take the solution of the Einstein field for many, many masses, spins, all different systems. And you have an array of them, something like 100,000 of these things, and pass the data through those and see what the cross-correlation is between the data that comes out of the system and the theoretical signals. And there you don't suffer the cross-correlation between the noise terms at the two detectors. It's you're using a piece of information that may be wrong, but if it's right, it's much, much better than just doing that cross-correlation. And here, there's that same thing. Here's signal noise again, and here's the... And there were a couple of other signals seen with that. You couldn't have done that without this technique. There was a signal, another smaller one, and here's sort of what that all comes down to. Uh, there was another signal that was just seen. I won't dwell it. It's identical in concept to the one we just been, we, the first one we saw. This one was published just about two weeks ago. Same thing. And here's sort of a summary of them all. This is the first one. Second one, which was not so clear. That one, this is a five sigma result. This is another five sigma result. But this was cross correlation between detectors. This is cross correlation with a template. And this is the new one, which is again, cross correlation between the detectors. You can get it that way. And I want to point you to one thing which is very, very interesting. And that's this number. These are the masses and the amount of mass that was lost in the collision. So this one was, you know, well, I, can't, I can't read it. 36 solar masses, 29 solar masses in the two black holes. The energy lost was three. Uh, solar masses, and now if you had taken that and placed it at 1 AU, put it where the sun is. This is a very interesting way to get a visceral feeling for this. You say the H value would only be about 10 to the minus 6. In other words, you would stretch by a millionth and compress by a millionth of your length and width. width. That's very small. But the power, amount of power that went through you is unbelievable. It's 10 to the 23 watts per meter squared. In other words, it's a what the sun emits is about 1,000 watts per meter squared. This is an unbelievable amount of energy that went through you. And that tells you something about that relationship I didn't make a fuss about, namely how much energy there is associated with a slight stretch of, of space. And I think I'm very close to the end. I just want to show you pictures of people, and then I'm done. Is that OK? Can I do that? OK. So here's the man who actually pulled the project together at a critical moment. That's Barry Barish, and Stan Whitcomb, who had been at Caltech working on this when Ron Drever went there. And then he was the project manager for the project who came with Barry. And then the, these are other people. This is the chief engineer of the project, uh, Dennis Coyne. And he was a, a sort of associate director that was part of the project and has been with us from the beginning, uh, Albert Lazzarini. And here are then people, as you notice, the people look younger and younger. Uh, here is the, there was a collaboration, and I, the, collaboration of the, the collaboration had in it uh, Peter Salson was the second, the head of the, he was the first elected uh, spokesperson of the collaboration. And then the next one was David Reitze, and here you know about Gabi because she was the one who was all over the world making this known to everybody that we had made this detection. And here are the different LIGO directors. This is the one who, this is the Jay Marks after the, uh, uh, after Barry, and then David Wrightsey, that's why he's in the middle here, is the current director. And these people are the people at the sites. I mean, you've met, you've met Dennis. David Shoemaker is at MIT. He was sort of orchestrating the development of the second detector. 
Peter Fritschel was the chief scientist for the second detector. And these two, this is uh, Valera Froloff and Daniel Sig, were the people at the sites who commissioned and actually made the detectors work at the sites. And one last picture then is this thing that I encountered when I was in New York, when right after the discovery, in the subway, I saw this picture. I mean, I saw this scene, and well, I saw that. And what it says, it's hard to read on that thing. It says, scientists found gravitational waves in outer space. If only it were that easy to find an apartment in New York City with a walk-in closet. <laughs> and then, uh, this was sort of February of, uh, yeah, 11. And here's two birds, this is in the New Yorker magazine. You, know, you can read that yourself. This bird talking to that guy said, was that you I just heard? Or was it two black holes colliding? I said, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.